Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. There are different roads from a place like NYU Law School. One quite crowded takes you to a million dollar law company. Another less traveled takes you to the powerless to help them become powerful. Andrew Friedman went to the Bushwick section of Brooklyn and helped to found an organization called Make the Road by Walking. I asked him to come here today to tell that story and I um, welcome you. Thanks. And uh, you graduated from law school. How did you? Why did you? How did you get to Bushwick? Sure. You kind of midway through law school. Um, I and a colleague of mine in law school, a woman named Una Chatterjee, I think we're both feeling increasingly uncomfortable mm -hmm. with uh, kind of traditional legal service. I think that you know, the stuff that lawyers for poor people do is essential: helping people in housing court, helping them access government benefits. I think that. What we were feeling was folks needed power, and if they had some power, they would need fewer lawyers um, to come in and speak on their behalf. And so we kind of set about thinking, how could we help folks organize themselves, build some political power for themselves? And we started meeting with organizations in different neighborhoods throughout the city because we felt you know folks are going to be skeptical, rightfully, of to law students um, who aren't from their community. And so we met with folks in Jackson Heights and Williamsburg and the South Bronx, and everyone was ecstatic at the prospect of free lawyers. Now we got tons of people who need this kind of help, but it wasn't until we got to Bushwick and met with a local pastor, um, mm -hmm. John Powis at St. Barbara's Church, who said, you know, folks need lawyers. It's absolutely true. And if you want to come provide some legal services, please come and do that. But what people really need is power. And we were both, yeah. had, had done eight or nine meetings and were starting to kind of get giddy inside. Uh. And because he's a veteran community organizer, he also said, well, why don't you come in next week and do a training? I think he kind of wanted to vet us a little bit. We then prepared, we were in law school, so we prepared an eight-page comprehensive <laughs> description about immigrants' rights to government benefits, got there, there were 85 Spanish speakers, they didn't speak English, we got through maybe the first paragraph of our <laughs> training, but after we did the training, folks came up and you know everyone had a letter from either the you know, Social Security Administration or from HRA, the Human Resource Administration here in the city, saying you're gonna lose your food stamps, you're gonna lose all your benefits. So we started talking to folks and we were really green. We, <laughs> we had the map of legal services providers, we looked at people's zip codes, we told them where to go, and we said, hey, we'll come back next week and see if you're unable to resolve the problem. Next week, every single person came back. They brought a friend. I was going to say, plus they, more, right? Exactly. They hadn't been able to get the attention at the local legal service office because they're swamped and under-resourced. Mm -hmm. And so then we started forming relationships. Today, you know, we got a staff of 45 people. We've got, we really have built a membership base of close to 3,000 community members who govern the organization. We're able to catalyze some public policy change and really important issues so it's been a, it's been a 10 yeah. year period full of lots of work but really uh, it's been an honor to, to So do there it. are two questions. One is what made you so simpatico with people who are basically poor people who need that you want to help and how did you fit into Bushwick is a very interesting community historically. You've got that on your website also, don't you about Bushwick or somebody sure. does. Um, how do you, what's happened to Bushwick recently sure. so that you've got you're so welcome there? So um, first, I think that you know it's probably a mix of things yeah. and on a different day. I, I always want to know how, how people what went on in there right. you know you know I think lives. part of it um, was the fact that I grew up in Washington DC in a very different time than now. Um, okay. There, it's a very segregated city. It's really segregated both by race and class. Um, and whenever I left DC, almost the first thing people said is, "Oh, what do you do about all the black people?" And yeah. it was, I, it felt like living there. I saw very firsthand how incredibly racist um, our society is, and so that gave me one lesson. And then you know, taking the bus or something as you would change neighborhoods, all of the white people would get off. It was, yeah. so that created some experiential sense of how unequal our society is. 
And ironically, I was on the privileged side of that divide, but it, it gave me a lesson. I think the other important thing was my grandparents were activists, were very political, um, and I think felt very proud of my father for the fact that he went from public school in Brooklyn on to be a doctor. Um, but I think they also sent me a clear message that you're different from him. You've had every advantage in your life, and it's your, really your obligation mm. to not hoard that advantage and privilege for yourself, but to try and make How our society better. How do we make other better. people have that? That's, I've always felt that way. I grew up during the Depression, I guess. I don't know. And it, the common good and to help right. other people. Anyway, Bushwick. It, you, it's a ch it's always a changing community, isn't it? It really has. I mean, the oh, it changes almost by the decade. Yeah. Um, you, there's a pastor in the neighborhood who started working, not Father Powis, a different uh, pastor named Father Kelly. Yeah, he's quite I was a talking. Character. He's a real character. He's yeah. been there since 1960. Yeah. And he said, you know, the Irish Socialist Party and the Italian <laughs> Socialist Party both had their headquarters in Bushwick. And then, um, but it was fundamentally an Italian neighborhood. Mm -hmm. At some point, you know, as a result of redlining and arson, um, you know, there was some real white flight. A bunch of African American and Puerto Rican folks moved into the and neighborhood. It was a, there was the, the ri and one of the riots and one of well, the blackouts. Well, in that in the blackout of uh, 1977, yeah. really apparently throughout the city, 80 buildings yeah. were bur burned to the ground. 40 plus of them in were Bush located in Bushwick. So it was devastated. The commercial strip along Broadway, I think, was barren for a while. The one silver lining here is that all that vacant land opened up lots of opportunity to build public housing in the neighborhood. And so, you know, now there's Hope Gardens, there's the tallest projects in New York City, the Bushwick houses. Um, and so these were a lot of these townhouses. That were right. Built, it was, I think, one of the first places they built kind of broad What's scale. The Nehemiah houses also, were they there? They're actually or they're in around? East New York, yeah. one neighborhood right. farther out. But Hope Gardens is humongous and it's scatter site public mm -hmm. housing. Um, so it's it's it it's kind of the favored vision, but often there's too much need and too little land, and so it's not the way it gets built. But in mm -hmm. Bushwick, it is. And then more recently, in the 90s, there was a wave of Dominican immigration, and most recently, a lot of folks from Mexico are moving into the neighborhood. And we started 10 years ago. There wasn't a single Mexican store or restaurant that I knew of. And now, uh, probably every other, if not two out of three, restaurant stores, video stores, groceries are started by immigrants from Mexico. So fascinating. So that's what led to your interest in, in immigration and in language. I mean, uh, the facilities we have to help people survive here? You know, it really, I mean, I think I was interested in immigration and the United States relationship with Latin America from studying in college. I think that... When we got to Bushwick, we interviewed folks about, hey, what would it take to get you to come to meetings instead of having dinner with your family? When would you like to have the meetings? And what, most importantly, would you like to organize around? And it was just striking. It was 1997, I guess. Everyone was crazy. You, I mean, you were in the city council. Everyone was crazy about Giuliani's kind of overhaul of the welfare system. Right, the and all of the advocates were focused on the things he was changing. What, what we found is we talked to folks in a neighborhood like Bushwick, and what people were crazy about was a problem that predated Giuliani, but became worse as the demographics of the right. city kept shifting. And so everyone said that they were most focused on their inability to communicate with New York City government and agencies that were supposed to be serving them. And so as a result of those interviews, that's what we started organizing So, I first. mean, if you were going into the welfare office and you went with somebody, you weren't allowed to go in there to help translate it? Is that no, what happened? No. What happened was if someone, you, the vast majority of the people right. who go into welfare so. centers um, don't go in accompanied by an advocate. Right. And so those folks would ask for applications. They would get them only in.